All right, welcome back. It is uh, lovely to see everyone today. My name is Blake Reed. Uh, I'm on the faculty here at the law school and one of the faculty uh, directors at the center. Um, and it's my pleasure uh, to take us into a second panel. Uh, uh, so we started practical today. We started talking about the role of uh, generative AI and the practice of law, but now we're going to get weird uh, and we're going to talk about art and music uh, and culture and intellectual property. And we have a, uh, just an excellent panel uh, to help us break this down. Immediately to my left is uh, Casey Fiesler, who's an associate professor in information science here at CU. Um, to her left is Daniel Acuna, uh, who's an associate professor uh, in the Department of Computer Science here at See you, Daniel, welcome. Um, and then uh, our colleague from down the road at DU, Viva Moffitt, uh, who is a professor of law at the University of Denver. Um, so Casey, we are in a moment, uh, I, I wish I could say we, we timed this conference intentionally uh, to be right around when the internet was just gonna be losing its mind about uh, the role of generative AI in art. So much is happening in the last week or two. We have uh, the amazing post coat picture, uh, we have the fake Drake song, uh, we have fan fiction, uh, the world is melting down. Uh, situate us, if you can, uh, in the sort of cultural uh, milieu that we're in. And maybe if you could start leading us down the road of why are we uh, filtering this through the lens of intellectual property? Um. Well, my, my first snarky answer to that question is because we don't have enough relevant laws about anything else. Uh, um, I mean, you know, besides, you know, I think some, some other things that are relevant are going to be like defamation, privacy, not that we have enough of that. Um, but it's, you know, we don't have a lot of laws around things like algorithmic bias, for example. Um, I also think that issues of ownership are just so, like, immediately it's something that people latch on to. Um, so, you know, now that I think many more people in the general public have a basic understanding of how these systems work, even if it's just, oh, it's trained on the internet, which I think is a sort of base level of what a lot of people realize here. They're like, but I'm on the internet. Um, uh, Blake mentioned this. I'm, I'm on the legal committee for the Organization for Transformative Works, um, which, you know, one might expect fan creators to be very like rah rah fair use remix. This is great, but actually, there's a lot of people who are very upset about their creative work um, being used to train these systems. So there's like the input issue when it comes to copyright, and then there's also the output issue when it comes to copyright, which is around things like um, how similar is this to, to other works or like who owns the copyright. Um, and I also feel like a lot of the, a lot of these, like they're going to be legal issues and there's already a bunch of lawsuits. Um, but these are also like deep ethical issues, like people's stuff being used without their consent to create technology that then might replace their jobs. Um, so I, I think that that's one of the reasons why copyright is coming up so much is because it's the legal thing that seems to capture ethical intuitions that people are having. So that's a perfect place for us to start. And before we dive down the rabbit hole on doctrine, I want to turn uh, to Daniel. Daniel, with the, this notion that we might have intellectual property issues around the inputs and outputs of these generative AI systems, can you help orient us and maybe return to, to Professor Certain's introduction on what the aspects of the technology are that are relevant how should we understand how this technology works for the purpose of intellectual property law? What are judges and policymakers likely to get wrong about this? Okay, well, thank you so much for the invitation and I'm very happy to be here. It's such a timely uh, uh, conference. Uh, I'm not a lawyer, that's not my background. I'm from computer science and I just, uh, I've been teaching uh, AI machine learning for a long time and a couple of, uh, well, a couple of semesters ago, uh, I taught uh, deep learning, applied deep learning. And one of the things that we discussed was precisely the technology that is behind GPT uh, uh, and chat GPT. So uh, I guess the, the basic idea of, of all these models, so I guess I'm gonna give like a technical uh, description of how these things work, maybe that would allow us to understand the IP implications. 
So the basic way in, this met in which these methods uh, work, they try to find relationships between inputs and outputs. And those inputs could be images, and the outputs could be, OK, what is in the image? What kind of dog is in the image or something like that? The input could be audio, and you want to predict, OK, what is the text? So it's text, uh, yeah, speech uh, recognition. Or uh, it could be text, and the, the input could be text, and the output could be text as well. So you want to the computer to find that relationship. Uh, so the inputs in this case uh, are, uh, for ChatGPT, will be instructions, and the output is text. So you want the, the computer to learn the relationship between the instruction that you give the, the ChatGPT uh, with, the, with the output that you wanted to generate. Now, um, these models fundamentally work on the idea that you want to predict uh, the next word, although more, more precisely it's the next token, because you want to kind of predict little pieces of text, subwords. Um, so the, uh, that task sounds simple. I mean, people have tried to do it for a long time. Uh, in fact, one of the first attempts was at the early 1900s when people were trying to build uh, simple uh, character predictions. So given this character, predict whether the next uh, character is a, is a vowel or a consonant. So that seems very simple. And you can get a lot out of, out of that. So you can generate text that, that looks you know, looks okay. Um, and, and over the years, many, many uh, decades, people created more and more sophisticated models. But we kind of hit a ro roadblock, I would say, in the sense that the, um, I guess, the complexity of language is such that we need very, very advanced methods to build this relationship between these instructions and the text that we want to generate. And um, over the last 10 years, we have these new models called uh, neural networks that basically find these extremely sophisticated nonlinear relationships between the text, the previous text, and the next word that comes in. The issue is that these models are so complicated that you need a lot of data to train them. And, and that means that we need data that we didn't have before. And we, we've, we've been able to acquire them just because you know everything is more digitalized these days. So uh, just to give you an idea um, of, of the data that we have, uh, ChatGPT, well, we don't really know how ChatGPT works, but we have some, uh, I mean, they release a paper, scientific paper, but it doesn't really explain much. Uh, but we know that it's using all of the internet. They're using the common crawl, uh, common crawl which is basically like what Bing or, or Google will do to crawl all the internet and index it. We know that they're using scientific papers, uh, and well, it, by using the, 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 the internet, it's using all languages, all kinds of writing styles, and all kinds of, of, uh, of qualities. Um, uh, and it's using uh, scientific publications, is using um, also code. So GitHub, which is this repository where people publish their code, uh, open access code, they, they upload their code there. And we know that they are using that for also uh, code generation. So um, I, I, th I think one of the issues is that, um, is that with these models, they are learning to, to make the prediction of the, the next token. And, um, and you get a lot out of that. I mean, it's amazing to me that you can, you can generate such sophisticated, um, uh, you can generate such sophisticated text out of this, what seems like a simple task, just generate the next token. But this, these models are just so complicated and so complex that they're able to generate uh, amazingly uh, high quality uh, text. And, um, but uh, sometimes they generate things that uh, we don't know if they're true or not. So we have the hallucinations. And sometimes they learn from biases that the text might have. So they might have not just you know, biases about things that uh, you know, we, we care about, like, like gender and race, but they might have other kinds of biases as well. And um, uh, in, my, in my research, one of the things that I study is potential uh, plagiarism in text and methods to automatically detect them. And one of the things that I'm, that I'm worried about is that in, this, uh, in chat GPT and these generative models, uh, you might have something that is generated and it's really hard to tell or impossible to tell if it was taken from the input. So this, this huge crawl of, of the internet, of code, and even they have something called free law, which is a huge repository of opinions from the law. So we don't really know if what's generating is a copy from the input. And we don't have methods. So we have a study where we show that detecting plagiarism with computational methods is really, really hard. So 
probably everybody knows uh, Turnitin, which is a company that detects uh, uh, plagiarism. Uh, but those are really basic kinds of plagiarism, so they're really hard, they're really bad at detecting uh, paraphrasing, for example. But, but So we don't really know if ChatGPT is generating paraphrasing. Um, and um, so I will just mention, the, uh, probably, I don't know if probably somebody already mentioned this, but uh, for example, the uh, creators of, uh, of the people that are uploading code to GitHub are complaining that many of the code that ChatGPT and uh, OpenAI Codex, which is this plugin that you use for programming, is generating code that is copyrighted. So it's taking pieces from the code that they, they never really uh, uh, wanted to be used by somebody else in this form. They, they argue that it's just, it's just uh, using their code without their, their, um, their consent. So there are two class, uh, um, um, class action lawsuits about this. Uh, and, and we have other cases outside of, of language. I know that we are in a law school and language is one of the most important things, but we have the same thing happen in image. I think in the title, yeah, we have mid journey. Oh, we used to have mid journey and I don't know, I miss, I miss it, but we have images, audio and other kinds of media where the same issues are showing up. Um, well, so Viva, I wanna to turn to you now. We've got this ecosystem of actors, uh, it's, it's quite complicated. So we've got folks who might have intellectual property rights on the data that's being used to train the model. We've got users of these tools. We've got the platforms that are administering these tools. Then we've got the outputs that they generate. One might think there are some intellectual property issues that we can identify in there. Uh, could you, in a few minutes, try and map out like where where do we start uh, issue spotting? Uh, what's going on here? What disputes are happening now? And then we'll go from there. Uh, right. Well, thank you so much, and uh, thanks for having me here today. Um, I, I think one uh, first, I want to say that and this is really, I think, useful to follow from Daniel's point, which is, I think there's a lot we don't know and huge amounts of uncertainty. And in fact, the, the, some of the things that we don't know, I think, raise some of the biggest problems for lots of the disputes, but certainly for thinking about intellectual property and copyright um, disputes. Um, and, and in the most broad sense, um, I, I do want to say that this is like, I think when we talked a little bit before this panel, I said, well, everything that's old is new again in, in copyright law. Um, uh, not, not 100%, but the history of copyright law is the history of new copying technologies that cause a whole bunch of people, incumbent industries, creators, uh, to freak out. And I think we're in that space space right now. So the very first one was the printing press. That's why we have copyright law um, in the first place. And more recently, you know, we've seen um, freak outs about the copy machine. I mean, the photocopy machine, um, Napster, digital technology. And I'm not saying that AI isn't, it's maybe is bigger and more revolutionary. Um, but, but one reason that we may be talking a lot about copyright law is that copyright law is the thing, the legal thing that has responded especially to these ownership questions that Casey raised um, uh, most, uh, most regularly in these kinds of situations. So it's the, it is in fact the most developed set of law um, that, that we have, well, I shouldn't say that because uh, somebody will tell me I'm wrong about that. Uh, but we do have this uh, you know, set of law that is used to thinking about what happens when we have a new kind of way to copy things. Um, and uh, you know, we said about the internet that it was uh, costless creation uh, or digital technologies, I suppose. So we're just in a new round of, of even more frictionless and costless creation. Um, and I think maybe I'll try to be really brief about this and we can come back and, and talk about it a little bit more. I mean, I think that the, the, the major legal issues should be divided into two uh, categories. And one of them, it has to do with uh, what these models, uh, how they are using the data that is, and this is where I have some questions, but are they literally scraping and copying people's works from the internet? Uh, so how exactly are the, the, um, the, the data being collected and then used by the language models? Um, and there are a few lawsuits that have been um, uh, uh, filed already. And even reading those complaints, uh, it seems clear that the people writing the complaints don't know how the technology works, um, uh, which is a common problem for copyright 
lawyers, um, I think. So I, I think that the question of whether uh, it, how that information is being used and whether that use is copyright infringement. That's sort of on the input side, what's coming into these models. So one of the, one of the main arguments is that the use of images and text um, and music in the training data is copyright infringement itself. Um, and uh, maybe I'll put that to one side and then talk about the on the output side, and, and I think we should talk more about the input side. Uh, on the output side, uh, one of the issues is, well, the, what's coming out of these uh, generators, the generative AI, is it, um, uh, one issue is, is it protectable? So there have been people who've gone to the copyright office with their images or text generated by, um, uh, by a, an AI, a, 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 an LLM, and, uh, and the Copyright Office has said in its new guidance, clearly no, if it is not, uh, if there is no human creator and contribution, then it is not protected by copyright law. Um, and they had, this follows on uh, not allowing the monkey selfie, uh, the monkey to be the copyright owner. So it's, uh, it's, it's not limited just to AIs who don't get protection, but any non-human uh, entity uh, uh, um, cannot get copyright protection. Um, so that's one output question uh, in terms of copyright. And then the other one is the extent to which uh, the outputs themselves are, are should be considered infringing. Uh, how many of them create uh, uh, copyright problems or other problems. So there have been other doctrines uh, brought to bear uh, that, or that people have thought about, right of publicity, um, DMCA problems, all kinds of other uh, aspects. But I would say the primary focus is on copyright law and whether uh, those things would be uh, infringing. So why don't I stop there? All right, there's a perfect roadmap for the rest of this conversation. <laughs> and I do want to come back to, to Casey on the, the first question, Viva, that you asked, which is, is there something new here or is this a pattern in copyright law of which AI is is just the latest in a in a series of technologies um, and I'd love to invite Daniel in on, on this one as well is there something profound and and new about this or is this uh, is just is this just the latest in a series um so I think I so I think the thing that is very similar is so why so I, I, I agree with Viva. I think that the, the, the freak out looks quite similar to the first thing that came to mind was like the VCR. So like mm -hmm. photocopiers, VCRs, uh, Napster. Um, you know, when I talk about this in class, I'm like, here's the, you know, the series of things that made the music industry lose their minds. Um, and and this is that. I think that I, I think the difference is that um, there also is the other side of it implicated where people are able to use this technology to create things that could be copyrighted um, is, is I think maybe what's a little bit different because like you weren't doing that with a VCR. Um, and uh, so there's this, there's this side of it of like people who are concerned about copyright infringement, but there's also people who are concerned about you know, can I protect this work that I'm that I'm creating? Could the work that I'm creating be um, infringement? And I actually think there's there's a lot of like ethical intuitions tied up in that too, because people have very strong feelings about like what like constant what should constitute creativity and what should constitute authorship. So I think that's the difference. Daniel, your thoughts? Yeah. Um, so I guess answering a little bit to to uh, what uh, Viva was saying. Um, so these methods, you can, th I mean, the simplest kind of method will be just a statistical method where you have, okay, given this word, what should be the next word? So you basically count, you go through the books and to the internet and you say, okay, given that I have this word, the, what should be the next word? And probably the word is gonna be, you know, cat or house and things like that. So you have a distribution of possibilities. Uh, but the, the thing is that these models that are now introduced as elements, they have so much they're just so complex and they have so, in a sense, like so much memory of what, what are all the possibilities that would happen after a, a text that they could in principle learn, memorize uh, what you use for training. So even though it's still probabilistic, still you have a distribution of words, uh, you, could, uh, you could think of, of ways of kind of force it to predict the most likely sequence of words. And that basically could account to just copying uh, the training. We don't have a, a lot of evidence of that, so people have taken texts 
uh, that ChatGPT generates and put them then put them in in uh, something like turn it in and turn it in says okay this is not copied from anywhere, but again uh, it might be paraphrasing so we don't really exactly know if that's happening. Actually, if you use things like image generation, which we don't have uh, here, something like Mid Journey or Sable Diffusion, which you say, okay, generate the image of a cat, uh, it will generate an image very high quality. And there are uh, studies that show that it's actually copying uh, the context at least of, of the training uh, data set. Um, so I guess uh, going back to what you were saying, um, Blake about how is this different from before. So we have methods that are actually called generative uh, learning. So you learn the distribution of data and these things have been around for a long time uh, since the 1900s. Uh, it's just that they were not that great. The kinds of things that you will generate were like mostly data points, uh, just, just two dimensional distribution of data. Uh, so the, but generating an image, for example, or generating in text, is something much more complicated. So I guess we have an amazing qualitative difference in what we're able to generate now. So that's, I think, why people are like, oh my God, I didn't think this was possible. Uh, so it's almost like, almost like a percolation process, which we've had this small incremental progress in the kinds of things that we can generate, but because we just have this cumulative knowledge of how to have uh, bigger data sets, but better ways of training them, that we have this huge jump in the perception of the quality that, that we can do. But in, in a sense, they are the same thing. We just have a, much, a capacity to input much more complex uh, data sets and output much more high dimensional uh, data sets. So uh, I think that's, that's what's making us, uh, you know, be very uh, amazed at these technologies. All right, so we, we have at least the perception of something new here. Viva, did you want to chime in on this one before we move on to doctrine? Well, I mean, I, I guess uh, I, I don't think I'm well positioned to talk about technologically whether this is something, you know, how, whether it's qualitatively or quantitatively, you know, uh, you know or both uh, um, different. But, uh, but I do think that the, you know, this question of what, uh, what, when a new technology comes up and it allows, it both allows uh, potentially copyright infringement on a massive scale, which I think we have to say this does enable that. Um, and it involves, it entails the ability to uh, create new creativity or new, I don't know, we should call it creation, but uh, a new, uh, new generation of work um, incredibly, uh, incredibly easily um, uh, is we do have sort of analogs for each of those in the past. And maybe this is a quantum leap uh, forward or more uh, but I do think there are some references that we can think about in the past to, uh, and, to help sort of think through some of the problems. And, and for that, uh, just to, to plug our technology journal, there's a fantastic article by, uh, by Mark Lemley about a decade ago called Is the Sky Falling on the Content Industries, to which we could probably plug into chat GPT and say, and add <laughs> and generative AI to the end of every paragraph, and it might describe what's, what's happening here. But Viva, you've taken us to the question about doc so let's let's go there. I think I just heard you say uh, copyright infringement at mass scale. So maybe let's start on the question of training the model and and the the inputs that are that are put into the model. And Daniel also added the users are providing some inputs. They're asking questions. So we've got some uh, we've got some inputs to deal with. Is that copyright infringement? And how do we how do we evaluate that question? Right. Well, of course, the, the, the right answer is it depends. Um, um, uh, that's the law professor answer, at least. Um, and so I guess I want to be really clear about the thing that I'm thinking about and what what the, there have been a couple lawsuits, at least already, that I've looked at. And those ones are alleging that, for example, uh, somebody's uh, image or um, the image they've created or their text or their um, music is on the web or otherwise available. Uh, and this is my understanding of what the allegations are, and that the, those things have been copied, I believe, that they have been copied, which is very important for copyright infringement, uh, you know, for the doctrine, have been copied and used as part of the data training set. And you can tell me if I'm wrong about that. Um, and uh, the, uh, the, the, do, the, the copyright argument is that that copying and use by 
uh, either the, I understand there are some entities that gather, actually gather those data, and that's separate from, say, open AI, uh, that they just buy or use the data set uh, from, uh, from somebody else who has gathered that data set. Uh, but that the copying of those, copying and use of those materials for the training purposes of the AI is copyright infringement. So that's my understanding that that's the, uh, that's the one, uh, one big set of claims is just in the training purposes. So nothing about the output of the, uh, of the, uh, of the AI. Um, and now you want me to answer the question of whether that is well, copyright infringement? Before we go to the, mm -hmm. the, the ultimate question, let me invite <laughs> Casey in. Casey, any thoughts on this, this sort of question of prima facie copyright infringement in mm -hmm. training? Um, I mean, uh, I, I am a very rah-rah uh, fair use person. <laughs> All right, we're going to get to rah-rah um, fair use yeah, in a second. Yeah, I but. mean, I, so I, I mean, uh, I think maybe there's some question about like whether a training model is like fixing something in a tangible like form of, ex you know, form of expression, like state. Um, yeah, I uh, probably like prima fa like probably. Yeah, <laughs> but, I but I don't know that it's like totally settled. And I agree that I feel like a lot of the people who are writing these lawsuits don't seem to have, aren't describing how the technology works very well. Um, but I, I probably. Well, and, and <laughs> so, I mean, this is the, the question I have is, it, are the models copying the works or are they just looking at them? Like the way I might go and look on the internet, are they just reading and which is technically, I think not a, a copyright infringement. Um, so that's, I think that's a technical point that I, I don't know the answer to, but the people filing the lawsuits don't seem to know the answer to that either. Daniel, do you have any clarity from well, the technical I, 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 side I of things? They're not literally copying. It's not that they, they copy and then they just produce that in the output, but they are using it for, for the training. So it's, I don't know, like, it sounds very similar to what a search engine would do. It just crawls the web copies things and then it tries to understand when you search for something if you like a web page why you like that web page so they try to find that relationship uh, so but this feels a little bit different because yes they are they're using that for training data but because these models are just so sophisticated and they might sometimes like because the, the question that you're asking or a specific next word that you're asking it to predict is just so specific that it might find, okay, I have this training data point that I use, and maybe I'm just gonna follow that because that's the most likely thing that I should generate, this specific article that is just very, very, uh, very, very narrow, and that's the most likely next thing that I should predict. So I'm not sure, I don't know the answer, uh, but um, um, yeah, so. Uh, it's it's complicated. I guess. <laughs> like, are, are, like, like I mean, uh, we could have the same conversation about just like scraping in general, right? Like, it, like is is all scraping that like researchers are doing and like common like is that, you know, is that copyright infringement? So let me add, <laughs> I guess I'm, because I'm, I'm computer science and I I write code, uh, so sometimes you write code. And, and you say, you put a license that is like very open. You, you say basically you can do whatever you want with the code that I write. Uh, but people are still suing GitHub. So basically the, the hosts of this code that he's supposed to have a very open license. So people have like a qualitative, like basically the, it seems that they were giving permission to use the code for others, to other, for other humans to, to use it and reuse it in, in, in their system. But it seems that they are not so uh, happy with, with a company using their code to sell a product such as a Codex uh, so that other programmers can code. So I, I don't know if that's what's the argument there, but I think there is there's something that is perceived to be different. All right, so we, we have created a set of messes here, but we've only got a few more minutes to, to, to solve them. So we've got these questions about threshold questions about about copyright infringement we've got in the github case the stripping of content management information the question about licenses of content how that all uh, factors in so we're not going to solve that because we've got to move on to fair use so um casey teed up the notion of uh, strong feelings of, uh, about fair use viva i wonder if i could turn turn to you though to to start us uh, Let's say that we have got prima facie copyright infringement here, and there's probably at least an argument that that's the case. 
is what these models are doing and what their users are doing with them, is that fair use? Well, uh, <laughs> that's all, I'll do that in just a minute or two. Um, so, uh, so I think, again, thinking about what the models are doing, to the extent I understand it, that is the kind of, like, can I use the word scraping, you know, that pulling that in, if we think that maybe there's a decent argument that that is copyright infringement, uh, that is copying and use, then the, the question is, would it nonetheless be fair use? So you don't ask the fair use question until there is, once there's copyright infringement, fair use is a defense um, to, cop to a claim of copyright infringement. Um, and, and I think there's a, a probably a pretty strong argument that the, the use of these models, uh, 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 the use by these models of the data for training purposes, uh, you could make a pretty strong argument, I think, that it is fair use. So one, you know, relatively recent um, um, example is the Google Books project uh, where Google, you know, copied, so that's like a lot, of, you know, kind of what these things are doing, copied a whole bunch of books, millions of books, um, and, and not for just then redistributing the books, uh, but for the purpose of allowing search and um, uh, enabling people to find these books and look at only snippets was part of the resolution. But the, the, I think that the, the, the end result of that was that, that the, the copying uh, by Google of those works was fair use. And that seems actually a fairly close analogy here not perfect, but a fairly close analogy with what, if, if, on, the, on the trains, I'm not talking about what people are creating with the AI, but the use by these um, uh, companies of, of, of the copyrighted material uh, and lots of non-copyrighted material for the training purposes. I think the argument would be, well, this is for a completely different purpose. We're copying these materials not for an expressive purpose, uh, but for this purpose of training this new technical tool to do these other things. Um, so I think, I think on that side, there's a pretty strong argument for fair use, not slam dunk. But. Viva, before we move on, so you kind of restricted that analysis to the, the training part of it. And I think we probably ought to open this up to the outputs as well. When we start considering what people are using these models to generate, does that change the fair use calculus at all? Uh, well, so uh, so then I think you have to you have to do a different a new copyright infringement analysis before you do a fair use analysis. So somebody puts into Mid Journey a text prompt to create an image, uh, you know, an, a, of that, a, a, and then so the question is: is that the is that action somehow copyright infringement? That's I think a really hard question. Um, I think that's a really hard question. Are you creating, I guess if you said, uh, um, uh, make me a, uh, a version of, let's assume the Mona Lisa is protected by copyright. Make me a version of the Mona Lisa in the style of Jackson Pollock. Um, um, is that then a infringing derivative work? All right, so I think you have to get to the copyright infringement question first before you can get to the fair use question. And, and what's your answer on the- On which one? <laughs> on, the, on, the fir, on the first part of it, on the, on the copyright infringement part. I, I, think, I, I think that's really tricky. <laughs> that one I think is a, is a hard, like, so you're using this kind of tool. It's not clear that there's any copying going on in the way that we ordinarily understand copying when, again, this is, I don't know how, the, how, the, how it works, the technology to some extent, uh, but maybe all of that is a derivative work. So that even if there's no copying, I'm creating a derivative work of a, I'm sorry, I'm not coming up with a good example of a image that is currently protected by copyright. Well, so, I mean, and, and just a, 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 a really tricky example is the fake Drake song yeah. this week, which is a new song that is performed in the style of Drake and The Weeknd, but is not a copy of any existing song, right? right? And so... So then I think copyright does nothing for, for Drake. All right, so we've got these threshold <laughs> issues of, of whether there's copyright infringement, and then we've got the, the, the fair use questions. All right, so Casey, you said rah, rah, fair use. I said that's how I usually feel. <laughs> but <laughs> it's almost as though you might be going um, a different direction. Well, no, I mean, I, th I, I, mean, I, I don't think that there's going to be any blanket answer for any. I mean, like any fair use case, it's, it's going to depend. Um, but, I, but I do think this point about, like, you can't just think about like the training process, it, like like what you do with it matters, right? For a fair use analysis, like 
there's a you know uh, Google uh, Google Books like you're you're taking books and you're creating a search engine, kind of like um, image search. Like you know you're taking the perfect ten cover, and then you're not creating another perfect ten cover. You're creating a search engine, but like here you're taking a bunch of Drake songs and you're creating a Drake song. And <laughs> so I like I I do think that that's a, a substantive difference. Um, uh, that said, I mean, I, I, if you had to ask me about it, like as a whole, I feel pretty positive about a fair use analysis for similar kinds of reasons, but I don't think that's going to ha- how it's going to happen in, in practice. It's not like the world is going to sue open AI for copyright infringement. It's going to be Drake and GitHub. Daniel, do you want to come in on this one? Yeah. So this is where my, uh, my law, uh, uh, ignorance. Uh, so I, maybe maybe I'll, I'll, I'll ask uh, Viva about this. But I, I feel like this. I, I guess I like what you said, uh, Casey, about you know what what is this technology we're going to use for? Because uh, ChatGPT is amazing. Uh, it's uh, as a as a uh, non uh, you know I don't speak English as my first language, and, and so I, when I use it with other languages, it helps me a lot. So I think there is a lot of potential for good use of this. I think people uh, perhaps are a little bit upset. I don't know if. If their charge for this technology to be used is that's that's worse, maybe that uh, goes into the reasoning for the fair use. Uh, I don't know. Um, there are. They, I'm just reading the data set that is used, likely by OpenAI and similar technologies, and they have a scrape of the web. They have uh, publications. They have uh, uh, code. They have open opinions. They have uh, patents. So. But, but and I study science and I would like to use, for example, this data set on science and, and I will not likely charge anybody for using the technology that I'm developing. I would like to do good things with these kinds of la- large language models. And I will just end by saying that uh, there are tons of things coming next that are not going to be like, that, that are likely going to be open. So they're going to be people not likely charging for this. It's going to be, be making these models specialized for certain fields, just putting them out there, not developing an infrastructure like OpenAI and charging $20 per month, but just leaving it out there so that people experiment. So I don't know in that case, whether that's fair use of, of these uh, inputs uh, to generate those outputs. So, um, but it sounds very exciting and something that we probably shouldn't, shouldn't con- constrain too much. So I want to zoom us out for our last few minutes here and talk about the implications of this technology for intellectual property policy. We've been talking so far about how intellectual property law might apply to these things, but we we also should think about where it's going to go. So Viva, may I'll start with you on this one. We've long thought of the purpose of the copyright system, at least in the United States, as being a utilitarian one that's designed to spur the creation of copyrighted works. And I I heard a a statistic this morning that there's something like a hundred thousand or hundreds of thousands are on the order of hundreds of thousands of of new uh, AI generated audio tracks being uploaded to platforms like SoundCloud and that kind of thing every day that will probably that order of magnitude will probably go up one or two as this technology evolves suddenly we might find ourselves awash in creative works generated by artificial intelligence what does that mean or what should that mean for the for the copyright system uh, well I, I mean that's a again a really a totally unknowable but one thing we have seen when I said, oh, you know, the history of copyright is looking at these new copying technologies is almost always there's been huge disruption. So really big change. Uh, you know, Casey referenced the, the VCR where, you know, uh, uh, movie studios freaked out about, like, freak out is like the only word you can use here, um, about the VCR. It turned out for quite a long time to ultimately create a gigantic market for them. Now, ultimately that changed also um, um, uh, over time. New technologies and streaming has come along and, and completely upended a sort of industries and markets. Um, um, and I think, and this is not to say, uh, this is without even focusing on individual creators. Um, and I think it's sort of, uh, this does seem really like the, the scale here of you know, how instantly you can just create a, a, apparently like endless numbers of, of Kanye's generated voice singing uh, any song you want um, is, uh, whether you find that valuable or not, I don't know, um, um, uh, is, I mean, the, the scale of what's being produced is, is sort of stunning and a little bit um, difficult to imagine how we're going to manage it. 
Um, and so copyright has uh, up until now and, and continuing, you know, uh, anything is protected by copyright as long as it meets a very minimal hurdle of, of creativity and it's fixed in a tangible medium of expression. One thing I wonder is whether this is going to push that question of whether we should have some kind of, of higher hurdle for copyright protection. I mean, that's um, that it, it's sort of it's almost like the system is broken if we have 10 billion new creative works created every year. So that's that's not a great answer. I mean, people are going to lose their jobs. New jobs are going to be created. New fields are going to arise and other technologies are going to die. I mean, that's. It is huge. Casey. Um, so I'll, I'll first mention that, so I, I, the copyright office started having listening sessions around AI and something that was raised a lot of the one this week was the potential for like collective licensing, which is interesting. But, uh, but the thing that I wanna raise that, I, that I, I, we hasn't been brought up yet is like the point at which something does constitute human authorship, I think is gonna be this big deal. Um, so for example, the, the, um, the, the comic book where the, the registration in the image was canceled because they, the copyright office you know, found out that it was created by Midjourney. That's not human authorship. It's like the monkey selfie or elephants painting or whatever. Um, there is a bit, so, so for those of you who, who haven't played with Midjourney, um, it's on a Discord server. So you can see all the prompts that people are using to, to make, if, if you're using the Discord server. Um, there is a huge difference between typing girl in a red dress into Midjourney and getting an output. I totally agree, zero human authorship should not be copyrighted. But I've seen people write five paragraph essays of a prompt tweak it a hundred times and come up with like, and does that constitute human authorship? Like at which point is prompt engineering actual human authorship? I think that is going to be a, a huge question because I do not think that you, can, that you can say that those two things are the same. So I, just to tie this back to the first panel, it's interesting the way in which prompt engineering has sort of been used to uh, encapsulate a lot of really interesting and important human work and to sort of uh, look at the amazing things we can get these models to do. And we sort of gloss over the fact that there is a, a huge amount of human input to get the model to actually behave that that way. So we see it in a professional context when we're talking about the practice of law. We see it in these creative contexts. Daniel, final final word before we go to the audience for questions. Yeah. Yeah, I really like the, the the idea of prompt engineering. I think uh, the same thing happened with ChatGPT. I mean, I've, I've, uh, I'm an expert now in, in developing these very complicated and sophisticated tweaks, uh, asking questions to ChatGPT, and some of the, there are databases of like clever ways of asking ChatGPT. So I don't know, maybe those are, those things are, are copyrightable. So I don't know. So I wanted to uh, kind of focus on things that I think are gonna change, like from the technology point of view, I think people are gonna, uh, my brother is like, an artist, if you will. So, so I think he's thinking about, um, um, he's like amazed at these technologies, but also he's thinking about ways of preventing the algorithms from just grabbing uh, the open uh, uh, work that he puts on the internet so that they use for training. So people are thinking about uh, creating uh, uh, like standard ways of saying, okay, don't use this, being that part of, an, of the image, like the metadata, or on a website having like a special text uh, file that says, you know, these are the permissions for training. You have that for search engines. So there is this file that you put in, at the root of your website called robots.txt and you say, please don't uh, index my web page. I, I, I have things, these things are too sensitive or something like that. So something like that's gonna appear. I think you're gonna be, we need to improve uh, methods to the text uh, generative AI. I think uh, it's, I, I'm very worried, especially since I work in science, there are uh, paper mills in, in, in some countries that basically if you pay them $50, they're gonna generate a paper for you uh, with images and they look uh, very good because you know we, the capabilities of these systems are gonna be, uh, are gonna increase over time. So we need better ways of detecting generative uh, AI uh, content. Um, 
and we are going to adapt. So I think it's going to it's going to make things. Yeah, if you write like good text that is grammatically uh, grammatically correct, maybe that's going to be that's not going to be that impressive uh, in in the future. Uh, so we are going to adapt, and I hope that also the law about copyright and uh, take all of all of those uh, all of these things into account. Well, a perfect note uh, to open it up uh, to the audience. And as always, under the wiser rule, the first uh, question uh, will go to a student. And I, I see at least a couple of my students have made the mistake of sitting like right in the front row here. So cold <laughs> calling is uh, going to happen. Are you a student? Uh, yeah. All right. <laughs> first question to you. Yeah, I'm wondering with the um, issues of authorship, right? Like an AI generated image does, is not like have an official author, then like who is a vo like liable for the copyright infringement if a generated image is considered copyrightable? I mean, so I've actually been thinking about this question. Uh, and I, I can't quite figure it out. Like if it's if it's not if it's not protected by copyright because there's no human authorship, uh, and then but if somebody has generated it, uh, you know, is it can it is is the person who generated it uh, uh, or put in the prompt the the the, the proper defendant? Uh, you know, is Open AI or whoever <laughs> the defendant? Um, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, th yes, I I assume at this point the law would say, oh, the person who, you know made the machine spit out that image would be the defendant for that being, uh, you know, a, 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 for the copyright infringement suit. And I think it would prompt some of these questions that I kind of teased out a little bit, like, well, did, like, was it, it, it was there any copying that went on? Or is this, it, is it a derivative work? Well, certainly could be if I said, you know, uh, uh, you know, if the prompt was, oh, copy, you know, take this photograph in the style of X painter. Um, so I, I, I'm sure that I bet that that's what the law would do, but I haven't seen that happen yet. So, Viva, I want to ask: these sound like really technocratic, like from the perspective of copyright law kinds right. of questions. From a policy perspective, are these like the right questions to be asking uh, if we're trying to figure out who should bear the bear the costs right. of, of infringement? Yeah, I mean, right. You give a copyright lawyer a hammer, and everything looks like a you know copyright problem. Um, so, I mean, I think you know maybe lots of the things that we've kind of talked about here make it really seem like maybe copyright is not a, a, a sort of capacious enough tool to kind of address some of these problems. I mean, that that's uh, and and some of the some of the other claims that have been brought are uh, akin to. So, in the Getty Images suit, they have their Getty Images watermark that does show up in a lot of the. Uh, in a lot of the the generated images, <laughs> sometimes like warped and weird and stuff, and and uh, so they've brought uh, trademark and unfair competition claims. I think there have been right of publicity claims that have been brought. So it's not it isn't just copyright that uh, that people have been um, sort of thinking about, but other kinds of. Um, Oh, did I say right of publicity? And then there are huge privacy concerns, of course. Well, so, Casey, you start us off with this point about other areas of law. Can we return to that briefly? If, if not copyright, what should we be thinking about instead? Um, I mean, there, you know, there certainly are proposals for um, laws around governing AI, right? Um, more so in other countries uh, than here. Or we, you know, we have like, um, you know, OSTP's uh, blueprint for a bill of rights for AI. Like it is possible that something like that could turn into law. I mean, do I think it will? No, but it's possible that something like that could turn into law. And it's very, um, uh, like rights based, like what, like what are our rights as humans to like have uh, transparency and algorithmic fairness and to not, you know, have our jobs replaced and, and these kinds of things. So, so that would be kind of the obvious thing is to actually govern AI, like to try to regulate AI in this country, which Maybe now. Um, and then there are other weird things that are popping up. Like there's been at least one defamation lawsuit already, which I think then brings up the like, does Section 230 apply to ChatGPT uh, question? Um, I, the answer is probably no. But um, uh, like that's coming up, and the question is like, you know, does the fact that you know OpenAI has this disclaimer that there might be wrong information, you know, does that um, you know make them not liable for that kind of thing? Excellent. All right. Another question. I'll go to a student first. If there are any student questions, Elsa, I will open it up. Is that a student question back there? 
Hi, I also want to preface that I'm not an IEP student. I'm interested in criminal immigration, but this is very interesting to me. Um, I'm interested in the music aspect because it seems that like art is really subjective, but like I saw a TikTok of Kanye West singing Rolling in the Deep and I was like, this is ridiculous. Um, but you know, like- I, I think Hey There Delilah is the better one, but we can discuss <laughs> afterwards. I'll have to look for that one later. Um, but you know, like that's their name and their image. And you know what happens when like you have like a really soft artist singing like WAP by Cardi B and Megan the Stallion like what does that do to their image and what kind of like lawsuits do you anticipate being brought because like everyone knows what their voice is and like what the other song is and so it seems very complicated. Eva do you want to take this right of publicity question I mean <laughs> maybe to give you a, ch a chance to think I, I mean there's this intuition I think that you, and I, I highly recommend for folks that don't know what's going on here, go listen to the Vergecast episode this morning, and they do a demonstration of how to make a basically a track using. Uh, they they do a track with Drake and with Eminem uh, and with Jay Z, and it takes just a minute. Like it really is pretty easy to do, and I think there's this sort of revulsion or amazement that when you see this happening, it's like, oh my gosh, you can just sort of take this person's persona and, you know, play, play creative God with it. What does the law have to say about that? Well, the law mostly has said you don't have a lot of rights in your persona or your name. Um, I, I think, uh, so that's a, a you know, it's really a state law um, uh, and state to state differences in rights of publicity that um, have sort of grown out of rights to the right to privacy. So it is not a very robust kind of legal claim, but I do think it has this, we have some feelings of intuition about like, oh, that seems kind of weird. And like, if it were me, I might not want that happening or, um, you know, and maybe that's a, and, and echoing sort of Casey's points about, are there some ethics to this that we feel that we, that we, that we care about? Um, and, uh, but there aren't the rights of publicity. I mean, occasionally sort of a sound alike has been allowed, a sound alike kind of claim has been allowed, but those have not been uh, very, uh, very effective ways to kind of police that. And I, I mean, I actually have to say, I think it's an open question of whether, whether we think you should be able to control that, uh, your name and uh, I mean, your, your sort of the use of the sound of your voice um, is, I think that's an open question about whether we're better off as society which is what copyright is trying to answer in general is like, is it how, how much creation do we want and how much do we want things tied up um, in, in, in rights? I also think that outside the, the right of publicity, like there's a, so we, uh, the US does not have very strong like moral rights as related to copyright in particular. So like for, you know, when you talk about um, market harm and fair use, for example, that doesn't mean this is going to embarrass you. Um, so like, you know, um, an author can't get upset about there being racy fan fiction written about their world that like that, like, um, you know, is like a moral rights thing. Like we don't have anything to protect that really. So the example of like, oh, you know, um, uh, Harry Styles singing WAP or whatever, like it's, it's, it's not gonna be a legal issue on the fact that like, oh, that's embarrassing and will make him look bad, at least on a copyright uh, perspective. Well, I, I just have to make an announcement previewing next year's programming. We're actually going to be ingesting all of the audio of these panels today, and we, we won't be here next year. It'll just be... Uh, you can trade the whole thing on my tweets. Yeah, that's, you don't need me anymore. Oh, your, your TikToks, perfect. All right, I think we've got time for one more question uh, from the audience. Yeah, it looks like a, a, perhaps another student question. Hi, uh, my name is Jacob. I'm a graduate student. Um, so in the last panel, we were, or it was kind of mentioned how good GPT-4 already is at kind of understanding laws and making, you know, judgments or assessments on them. Um, and I know a lot of this still is up in the air, undecided, but in theory, if we, you know, drew the line and made some copyright laws here, you could give those laws to something like GPT and tell it, hey, generate an image, but keeping in mind, you know, like don't create something copyrighted. Like, how would you reconcile that type of situation? All right, we have robot creators versus robot lawyers. <laughs> Who wins? <laughs> Go. <laughs> That's an interesting example. So, so a lot of these systems already have safeguards in them, right? So, for example, 
I, when I was playing with ChatGPT, I asked it to write me erotic Batman fan fiction, and it nice. it refused. It refused both on the grounds of co content and on the grounds of intellectual property, <laughs> uh, which I thought was interesting. But so in theory, these kinds of things could be built into the system if we knew what these answers were. Yeah, I would. I guess. Yeah, that's a very interesting uh, question. I think. I think it's going to happen. I think. Uh, there is some discussion that ChatGPT uh, or GPT-4 kind of reached the limit of how much data they can ingest and how big the model is. So it, there is some discussion about how much more we can extract with just kind of scaling these these models, or or like we run out of the we run we don't have more internet unfortunately. So I don't know what more data we can use. So kind of answering more complicated question will require some time to kind of make them uh, reason more uh, uh, with more sophisticated uh, uh, reasoning. Um, but I think in general, we're going to adapt. I mean, I see that all of this, I mean, all of these laws, you know, are going to start uh, becoming update, outdated. So I think with, I mean, when Photoshop came out and we were able to modify things and modify the image of anybody and people kind of got used to it. So, okay, this is Photoshop. This is, I, I won't believe this. And I think something like that will happen if we see something written on the, you know, the, some, some uh, essay uh, denying global warming or, or something like that. And, and it's very uh, well written and, and lots of uh, good citations. We're going to, you know, add some, some doubts. Well, maybe this was generated or something like that. Um, the same with, uh, with flat earth and synth uh, things like that. And with elections too. So we have an election next year and we're going to see lots of, probably lots of, of nonsense on the internet just uh, facilitated by these technologies. So hopefully we'll adapt, the, the, the laws will adapt and just people will kind of, you know, become used to, to this, uh, unfortunately, to this noise. Viva, just quickly before I go to you, there's an amazing picture out of one, uh, one of the image generation uh, of uh, Donald Trump and Barack Obama playing basketball. And it's uh, when we start to think about how that might uh, might come up in the election. Very, very interesting. Final thoughts. Well, one one response I had to that question was that, like, I think we absolutely need to think about how we might be able to use like the you know, these these kind of tools to help solve the problem. I mean, I think that's sort of what you were getting at is can, can we, you know, maybe they can actually help us, but I also think we need to be really, really careful. And maybe this really leads to the next panel, but careful about how much we want to give over to the tools uh, as, you know, I don't want a system that is going to tell me I can't make fair use of a you know, or, or be something that just automatically decides that my use of something isn't fair use. And that's a very minor point, but I think that raises all kinds of much more significant um, concerns about how AI operates. All right, on that note, we are standing between uh, you and lunch. So please join me in thanking our panel for the excellent discussion. And